Well, hello, my name is Gino Passi. The date is Tuesday, January 23rd, 2018. Today I'm interviewing uh, Dr. Fritz Casey Leininger as part of the History 3097 Honors Seminar entitled Bearcat Legacies, and also as a part of the Emeriti Association History Project. Fritz, thank you for uh, being willing to do this interview with us. Glad to do it. Um, to begin, I know Fritz, I'm assuming, is a nickname. It is. So could you, for the record, just state your, your full name? Charles Frederick Casey Leininger. Okay. Now, I know your father was a Leininger. Right. And your mother's maiden name was Dean? Yeah. So where does the Casey? My wife. Your wife's name, okay. So we hyphenated. Good. And when and where were you born? I was born on February 22nd, 1949. Uh, my parents lived in Woods Hole, Massachusetts on Cape Cod. I was born in Toby Hospital in Wareham, Massachusetts, just off Cape. I'm sorry, in, in Wareham, Massachusetts. Wareham, Massachusetts, okay. Were both of your parents East Coasters? Um, yeah. Okay. Though they met in Chicago. <laughs> okay. And Again, just because I know a little bit about your history, how then did the family emigrate to Ohio? Um, so my dad worked for, um, worked in the retail cooperative movement, which um, had uh, customer-owned grocery stores in a number of cities around the country. And he got his start doing education about the cooperative movement, how to, how to set up stores, um, what the philosophy of the cooperative movement was. He was doing that in Chicago. Um, he had, um, so he had gone to divinity school at Harvard and become a Unitarian minister. And after about six years of that, he discovered, as he said, it wasn't that he was defrocked, he was unsuited hmm. to being a minister. Um, this was about 1940, went back, and his parents had moved to Ohio by that time. Uh, his dad and his brother were in the sheet metal business. They brought him into the sheet metal business. Uh, wasn't something he wanted to do went to work uh, in the co-op movement in Ohio and then moved to Chicago. Um, my mother was a, a nurse, um, uh, had uh, done her training at Boston Children's Hospital, worked there and in New York City. Um, by 1940-ish, she had decided, you know, she was wanted to try some new stuff and got some training as a physical therapist and then got a job in Chicago as a physical therapist. Um, and my parents met in a uh, cooperative co-ed rooming house um, in the Hyde Park area of, of uh, Chicago. Um, my mother almost voted against my dad moving in, but he did and they, uh, they fell in love and got married. Um, I think they both wanted to return to New England and um, dad decided that if he was going to do co-op education around cooperative stores, he ought to run one. So he moved, they moved to Needham, Massachusetts, where he ran a store, and then to Woods Hole, where he uh, ran that store. And, and eventually come back to Ohio at some point? Yes. Or we, come to he, Ohio? He came, um, the cooperative movement in the early 1950s was disappearing as the economy, so the co-op movement had developed in part in response to the collapsing economy in the 1930s, uh, the, the, what looked like the death of capitalism. Uh, by the early 1950s, capitalism was uh, doing very well um, and the commitment to alternative economies um, was disappearing. Um, 
and his store did not was not doing well, so he was fired. Uh, moved back to Ohio to work with his uh, father and brother in the sheet metal business again, um, and eventually, um, after a couple of different jobs, ended up working for a small folk song book publishing company in Delaware, Ohio, where I grew up. Okay, so you grew up in Delaware, Ohio. Pretty much, yeah. I was going to ask you if you had a blue collar upbringing or white collar, but it sounded like it was a little bit of the answer is yes yeah. to both. Uh, Dad had uh, working class jobs most of my life. Uh, Mom was a nurse, which was distinctly poorly paid when she was a nurse. Uh, so we had working class incomes. Uh, Dad grew up working class. My mom grew up in a upper middle class uh, family. In Maine, um, but always, but her career was uh, was a working class career. But now, when you were after you were born, had your father was he an academic at that point, or was he in the store? At uh, that he point? was in the store when I was born. Okay, but had a college education as he did had your mother. A, a master's. Um, my mother flunked out of college, um, and then not because she was not committed to. Uh, academics, uh, but was a wonderful nurse and did very well. And had to get some schooling to become a nurse. Right, right. Yeah. she did. Um, I don't think she ever had a bachelor's degree, but you didn't need that right. to be a nurse in her era. Um, so your dad had gone to college, your mom not so much. Was going to college as a young man, was that something you distinctly in your future or not so oh, much? Oh yeah, it was, I grew up, it was like my brother and I were going to go to college and that we would have um, professional jobs. Okay. And so, uh, as your senior year approached, where did you find your interests gravitating? Like, what, what was it you wanted to study? Everything. Which was one of the interesting things about my family is that we sat around the dinner table talking about politics, theology, math, science, um, everything. Um, and I literally, when I got to college, I changed my major literally every couple of quarters. <laughs> and as far as your upbringing is concerned, and this is just, I hear co-op, I hear folk songs, I hear um, uh, Unitarian minister. I'm assuming it sounds like a, a progressive upbringing, family. Yes. Yeah. Okay. My, uh, my dad grew up Methodist and Republican. And when he, when he went to college, he, con he apparently had some sort of conversion experience because by the middle of his freshman year, he was a pacifist and a socialist. Okay. So you then chose to go to what college as an undergraduate? I went to Antioch College, which okay. was um, a very interesting, very progressive school. Um, it had a co-op program for everybody, not just for science and engineering, uh, which was a wonderful experience. Was Antioch's progressive nature part and parcel of why you chose to go yes. there? Yeah. Had you applied anywhere else, or you really had your sights set on um, Antioch? I applied to University of Chicago. Uh, my dad thinks I also applied to Oberlin. I don't remember that. Um, I actually graduated after my junior year in high school because I wanted to get the hell out of my small, very conservative uh, central Ohio town. Um, Chicago had a program where they accepted um, juniors out of high school, uh, but they waitlisted me uh, and Antioch accepted me and, that, and I would have chosen Antioch anyway over Chicago. And what did you end up, you said you changed your major several times. What was it that you ended up settling on? Well, I didn't, really. Okay. Um, Antioch allowed you to build a um, interdisciplinary major, which meant that I could actually graduate. Um, so it was called environmental studies, but it included history, anthropology, hard science. Uh, at the end, I was actually, um, uh, thought I was going to become a geologist uh, because I was doing a lot of um, hiking and camping and really liking being out in the woods. 
Uh, so I thought, you know, being a geologist, I could get paid to do a lot of hiking and camping and climbing mountains. And so you graduated with this environmental science degree. Environmental studies. Environmental studies, I'm sorry. It was a BA. Um, with the intention of possibly going into geology as right. a career. And I went, to, I went to Boston College and got a master's in geology. So let me step back. Was it, was it just nature in general that you were enthralled with, that you just wanted to study? Um, you said you enjoyed hiking. Is that pretty much what led you to focus on geology, or right. were you still kind of unclear and you just picked something? Um, I thought I was clear um, towards my senior year. You know, I think by the beginning of my senior year, it's, geology seemed like a way to be paid to be out in nature. And, you know, the geology courses I took, I found really interesting. And what year did you graduate? 1971. And so you said you go to Boston College? Yes. Then directly after undergrad? Yes. So part of early in my senior year, it was like, hmm, I'm going to graduate from college. What the hell am I going to do next? I guess I better go to graduate school. And so you spent two years at Boston College? Or no, it took me five years. Okay. So Partly that, because um, I didn't have a strong undergraduate background in geology. Um, so I had to be um, retrained. I had to take extra undergraduate courses. Um, and then I was required to do a thesis, which just took me a long time. What was your graduate, your master's thesis on? Um, a brittle fracture of granitic rocks. Okay. <laughs> Which sounds fascinating. Don't get me wrong. I, 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 occasionally I look at my master's thesis and go, I have no idea what this means. <laughs> so, okay, so you go there for about five years. What are you doing to earn an income? Do you have a family at this point? No, I, um, I had a free ride my first two years of tuition and um, $200 a month, uh, which in 1971 was just barely enough. Hmm. Um, I, third year I had tuition remission and borrowed money, and fourth and fifth year I was only registered for like one course a semester and had a part-time job in a um, uh, an outdoor store, backpacking store. Which seemed to fit with your oh, yeah. inclinations. Yeah. Okay. And I was also beginning to do some carpentry and home repair stuff as well. And so when you graduate with your MA, do you then go, do no, you then that. continue to study uh, granitic uh, Actually, rocks? it was an MS, a Master of Science. Master of Science, you're right, sorry. These, these kinds of distinctions, talking to the students, the distinctions between BAs and BSs and MAs and MSs are really important in the academic world. They are. To some people. So do you go in then? I mean, do you become a geologist? Uh, no, I discovered that that almost all of the people I was in graduate school with were going to go to work for oil companies and mining companies, and as I thought of it at the time, they were going to go help rape the earth. Sure. Um, and um, I had had a checkered career as a graduate student. Um, was not well liked by my faculty by the time I left because I talked back to them. Um, so I moved to Ohio where my brother was living um, and we went into the home handyman painting business, self-employed home handyman business. Um, was that in the Cincinnati area? In Cincinnati, oh. yeah. Um, how long did you do that? How long did you stay in that? Um, off and on field? from 76 through 89. Okay. Um, so that became a career. Yeah. Essentially. Yeah. Um, um, I was also involved in progressive politics. Um, 
started reading history on, on my own and thinking that history might be helpful in thinking about how to change the world um, and decided um, that I would, uh, that maybe I should take some graduate courses. Uh, called up the history department here, talked to Gene Lewis, who's department head at that time, um, and he, he said, sure, you can, you know, why don't you sign up for um, introduction to the literature of American history? Um, and I did that, and did that sequence my first year part-time, and did well enough that I was offered an assistantship and tuition remission so I could go full-time the next year. And that was what year? Started part-time in 82, okay. was full-time in 83, 84. Um, and I got, f in, in 83, I took a course on the history of Cincinnati, uh, where the professor required the graduate students to do a piece of original research, not just write a book review or do um, library research. And I had, was, had been living from 77 to 81 in a communal household um, in Avondale, and almost all of my neighbors were African American. Um, many of the houses on the street were, had been clearly middle class and upper middle class houses. There were, we lived in a three-story Victorian mansion. Um, and um, so I proposed to him that I figure out it was clear to me that at some point this had been a wealthy white neighborhood um, and had been told by Cincinnatians that that was true. Um, and so I decided to do a research project to see if I could figure out when it changed from white to black and why. Um, and that laid the basis for all, almost all of my future research down to the present. And at this point, are you thinking, this is my next career, this is what I'm going to do? I, yeah, it became clearer and clearer to me that I love doing nitty-gritty, getting my hands dirty in the archives history, mm -hmm. uh, putting together stories, uh, getting an understanding of stuff that had happened in the past that uh, no one else really had ever figured out. Uh, it was just, it was, it was fun, it was exciting, um, and I thought that the story of, of racial change in Cincinnati's neighborhoods uh, was an important story to understand um, in the history of racism. Because you started to gravitate toward that housing, social justice, the history of housing and neighborhoods, did your background in home renovation have anything to do with that or are they completely separate? They're completely separate. Um, but the interest in racial justice goes back to the fact that I grew up at the height of the civil rights movement, um, was aware, my, well my dad was, my parents were not activists. Uh, they were paid lots of attention to um, progressive politics, the civil rights movement. Um, remember my dad brought home a comic book that uh, had been put together to put together, or to, uh, to publicize the Montgomery bus boycott, the Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King story, um, and being really influenced by that. Um, and in fact, um, at some point I was left home alone with my older brother and he told me to do something. And I said, no, I'm engaging in civil disobedience. You can't make me do that from reading this comic book. Um, and I had a black cousin um, who's um, Godfather was a, a prominent civil rights leader in the 1960s. So I, and he was almost exactly my age, and I, I really kind of grew up with him, um, and knew knew his story. His dad was uh, was an African American lawyer in in, um, in New York. Um, his mom was my dad's younger sister. Um, so race, racial justice. Um, Social justice was an essential part of who our family was. 
Um, and so it was no surprise that when I decided to do history and that I would want to do um, history of, of race, social justice. Um, and, you know, I keep coming back to it. You know, occasionally I'll work on a project that's not really that. And I was like, hmm, this is interesting, but not what I want to do. Well, and a lot of your research is focused around neighborhoods and uh, white flight and housing and things like that for African Americans and the underrepresented. And, and that, mm -hmm. is, that has kind of become your It's my, your my thing. career. Right. So you come back to graduate school in the early 80s, mm -hmm. and then you get an MA, is that right? Right. This, this one took me seven years. Okay. Um, in part, or for two reasons. One is that my advisor kept asking me questions. He wanted me to answer on my thesis. Mm -hmm. and, then, and I had told him that once I got my MA, I, was, I had a prenuptial agreement with my wife that we would move back to New England, which is where she, she's from Massachusetts. Um, and was this he, a real prenuptial? This was it, not a written record. It wasn't written record. down, but it was like, okay, if you move to Ohio to marry me while I get my master's, once I get my master's, we'll move back to Massachusetts. So did, you met her while you were living uh, in Boston? In Boston, okay. getting my first master's. Um, and we had an on again, and then a long time off again uh, relationship before we decided that we actually should be on again. It's a 10 year gap in there. Um, and you sucker her into moving to Ohio. Well, we negotiated I see. <laughs> her move to Ohio in exchange for we'll move back. Um, and I think my advisor was like, if I keep asking him questions and make him keep working on this thesis, he'll give up the idea of moving back to Massachusetts. Um, but, and then we had twins, which you know how much work twins are. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, we finally moved back to Massachusetts, uh, where I worked as a house carpenter for a couple of years, um, and kind of continued to tinker with um, the, um, the thesis and, um, and a book chapter that I had been asked to do. Um, and so in so we moved to Massachusetts in fall of 86. Spring of 88, um, my wife's former employer in Cincinnati came out to Boston for a conference and basically said, I will give you a lot of money if you'll come back to Ohio. I'll pay you really well, and I'll give you a signing bonus so you can afford to make the move and buy a house. And I've been working as a house carpenter for wealthy people. She had been working as a wealth, uh, wedding planner for wealthy people. Uh, both of us were doing good work, but not making enough money. Um, I was tired of dealing with rich people. Jenny was tired of dealing with rich people. Uh, these, these were not careers we wanted. Um, and I knew that uh, from what my advisor had said, that if I finished my master's, um, and came back, but they would give me a teaching, give me an assistantship and tuition remission, <clears throat> that I would have a free ride to get my PhD. Okay, wow. So, Jenny's offered lots of money to come back to Ohio. My advisor said, if you come on back, finish the master's, we'll give you a, a, a free ride. And who was your advisor? Chris? Zane Miller, who Zane was Miller. Uh, UC's long-time uh, urban historian. Uh, for many years, he was the person you went to if you wanted to know something about the history of Cincinnati. He was the guy that got quoted in the newspapers. Hmm. So you, you come back here then, and you decide that the PhD is the route you're going to take. Um, and continuing on, I assume building on your master's thesis yes. and the research that you had done there. Yeah. What do you end up doing your dissertation on? Um, race and housing and neighborhoods. Uh, I, I, my master's was specifically on the Avondale neighborhood. Uh, I expanded it 
to a, a wider area, um, looked at um, city planning, how that impacted it, um, how uh, racial discrimination in housing had, had impacted um, where blacks could live. Um, and um, so that, that story is from about 1945 to 1970. Okay. Looked at the transition in the thinking um, amongst planners and housing reformers from believing that racial segregation was a good thing to realizing that it was a bad thing. Um, and coming into coalition with civil rights activists who came to, who wanted uh, there to be laws making racial discrimination in housing illegal. Um, so my story is, is neighborhood racial change, why that happened, and then the growth of a fair housing movement um, and how that was related to, I mean, it was very much intimately tied up with, um, well, actually a massive displacement of African Americans from the old West End black community when I-75 was driven right through the middle of that community. <clears throat> and the planners decided that the housing there was so horrible it had to be leveled and the people needed to be rehoused. They did a great job of leveling that housing and they did a terrible job of rehousing the people who were displaced. So African Americans were, tens of thousands of African Americans were displaced from the West End within a tightly segregated housing market, which meant that they were all funneled into the margins of existing black neighborhoods. Um, at the same time that whites were moving in large numbers to the suburbs uh, because federal housing policy made it possible to buy, a, for whites, to buy a brand new uh, suburban home on a grassy lot um, and then take the interstate, the brand new interstates to work. So whites could escape the city easily uh, at the same time that blacks could only move into certain neighborhoods. Now in the early 1990s, is this a topic that a lot of scholars are working on or at least in UC, do you find yourself kind of alone in that scholarship? Um, there wasn't anybody else, at, in, certainly in the history department, who was working on, on that topic. But it was, it was a pretty hot topic nationally. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of other scholars working on it from a variety of points of view. Um, there are a whole series of books starting in the late, uh, maybe late 50s, early 60s, examining how uh, what we then called ghettos developed. Mm -hmm. um, almost exclusively African-American neighborhoods, um, and tight, intense racial segregation enforced by discrimination. Sure. Um, so there were a series of books that examined that in a number of cities. Um, and, you know, I, um, and actually there had been a previous doctoral student at UC who looked at those issues for Cincinnati in the pre-World War II, up through the end of World War II, uh, and I could, I was able to take what, he, you know, build on the work he had done. Um, if he hadn't done his book, I would have had to go back to the early 20th century. Um, but fortunately, Bob laid this very nice uh, foundation that let me start at World War II. So. You get your dissertation, you're, you get your PhD, do you, what happens next? Are you immediately given a faculty position here? Do you adjunct? Do you do something else? Go back to renovating homes? Uh, did not go back to renovating homes except my own. Um, worked as an adjunct at UC for about a year and a half. Um, was on the job market had lots of interviews uh, 
included several finalist interviews and was never hired. Um, At this point, you were willing to move wherever the job was, and yeah. Um, For a variety of reasons. So, in the so I got the PhD in '93. In the fall of '94, I heard about a um, position doing social policy analysis for the Cincinnati office of a national organization called the Children's Defense Fund. Uh, the executive director of, of that was my wife's executive director's sister. So I got that, I got hired to do social policy. I got that job for the old gals network as opposed to the old boys network. Um, and did that from 95 through 2002 while continuing to teach one or two courses a year at UC. Um, and keeping my hand in a bit I guess I, I think I did one other academic publication article in that period, um, but was mostly doing social policy stuff and doing some, some writing uh, for that. And maybe a little UC history here as an adjunct, because mm -hmm. I think you know adjuncts notoriously talk about you know, un getting overworked, screwed. underpaid, getting screwed. How was the adjunct culture at university? Was it similar to nationwide trends? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, um, let's see. Um, 93, 94, I worked, I had, it was basically three quarter time. Um, as an adjunct, so three quarters of a full teaching level. And what courses were you teaching? Uh, basic American history. Okay, survey courses. Yeah, uh, and I was making less than I did as a, a doctoral candidate. And my income declined. Right. Uh, because the pay was so lousy. I think um, I was making about $3,600 a quarter, um, three times that. So I was making about 10000 a year. At what point do you get hired as a full-time faculty member here? So that was a long and winding road. Um, I left Children's Defense Fund in 2000, at the end of 2002, set myself up doing um, social policy consulting um, since I my work was well known in, in Cincinnati social service community. Um, a lot of what I was doing still had to do with race and poverty. Um, and um, continued to teach a couple of courses a year at UC. Um, and just about the time that I left Children's Defense Fund, the evening college, which I was teaching in, uh, was wiped out by the uh, university administration. So this was a teaching, uh, an evening college at UC. Right, a separate evening college, um, which had been really important to, and, and actually I, I think had remained really important to a lot of working class uh, Cincinnatians who work full time. Catered to non-traditional mm -hmm. students. Um, yeah, I had lots of adult students um, who were, you know, had working class jobs, but, and many of them were UC employees who got tuition free, um, but they were, they, they were wonderful to work with because they knew why they were in college. They wanted to be there, um, not always well prepared, but willing to work hard, mm -hmm. um, really satisfying to work with. But the UC administration decided to wipe out Evening College for, a variety of reasons, one of which was that it was retaliation against the Dean of Evening College for fights between her and the senior administration. Uh, she retired, 
and the senior administration said, now it's time to get rid of the Union College. And UC decided to move what were open access parts of the university away from the Clifton campus. Open access meant that if you had a high school diploma, you were automatically admitted, uh, not to ANS or any of the professional schools, but evening college and a two-year college on this campus called University College. Um, now that work is done by Claremont and Blue Ash. Would you still get a degree, like an associate's degree, if you attended those, or yes. would you just eventually matriculate into a professional school? Um, you would get a, um, yeah, you'd get an associate's degree of, from Evening College. I think you might have been able to get a BA in Evening College, I can't remember. Uh, University College was just an associate's degree. <clears throat> and you could, if you were successful with your associates, you could apply to uh, Arts and Sciences or any of the professional schools. Uh, your admission was not necessarily guaranteed, however. So I, um, the history courses in Evening College <coughs> were brought back into the, the ANS History Department, which brought me back in contact with um, people who had been my teachers as an undergraduate. Um, um, Barbara Ramasack was department head at that time, and, and she was, um, was very pleased to have me uh, teaching evening courses. Um, and then I picked up, in um, 2006, I picked up a contract to write a history <coughs> of um, the local legal aid society. Actually, Jean Lewis's wife, Dottie, worked there in um, uh, fundraising, and she connected me with the executive director of the legal aid society, and I got a fairly substantial contract to write um, what turned out to be a 100-page history of the Legal Aid Society <clears throat> that was very successful, uh, really brought me back to the attention of my colleagues in, uh, who were teaching during the day, was hired to teach full-time for one year as what was called a visiting professor. Mm -hmm. uh, and. Um, Friends of mine within the department started talking about how do we, we want Fritz full time on the faculty, how do we do that? Um, and there are budget, budgetary problems persuading deans that they should hire someone with my expertise. Um, but eventually I was able to pitch myself as a public historian um, because I had worked outside of the academy outside of the university doing both social policy and um, you know contract historical research um, and so eventually the department was able to sell me to the then dean uh, and I was hired full-time uh, in 2012. So there was no national search or anything? No, there like was it? a search. Okay, all right. Uh, it, the, the rules require that they have to do a formal search, uh, but I was, uh, I was asked to write the job description. <laughs> um, and and no. to be fair, they, did, they interviewed two other people um, who uh, they said were, uh, were quite impressive. But they, I had a track record. Right. Now, is this something that sort of, um, that trajectory, is that something that happens at other universities? Somebody joins a department, people like them, they want to keep them on? I, th I think so. Um, um, I don't know a whole lot about it. I do, did have a, I do have a friend who actually had a full-time tenure track job at Wilmington College, a small college about an hour from here. Her husband taught over in Northern Kentucky. They lived in Cincinnati. She was really close friends with um, a senior faculty member who had been her PhD advisor at UC. And um, he wanted to bring um, her back into the UC psychology department um, and eventually was able to um, 
get UC to hire her as um, uh, what they called a um, um, an educator assistant professor, which is what how I was hired. It's not a tenure line hmm. job. Um, Three-year contracts that are renewable indefinitely and with a possibility. So it's, I think it's not uncommon uh, if someone knows someone and wants them to try to figure out how to, how to hire them. Sure. But there are, have to be formal searches mm -hmm. and, uh, there have, and the dean has to sign off on it. So uh, it's, you know, the way my advisor was hired at UC was that the head of the department in the mid-60s called his buddy who was the head of the department at the University of Chicago and said, hey, have you got anybody who can teach urban history? And Zane had done his dissertation on late 19th century Cincinnati history and um, so they hired him. And that was enough. That was enough. They were, right. I'm sure there was no formal search. Sure. And no competition. Uh, very different. Certainly. So you kind of, as an adjunct and maybe visiting professor, you're kind of on the outskirts of departmental culture, history department, A&S yes. uh, college, arts and sciences college. When you became a full-time professor, was it an eye-opening experience for you, now being completely submerged in this culture, or was it no surprises? Well, there um, a lot of, uh, I knew a, a lot of what to expect going in. Um, what I hadn't realized, even when I was a full-time visiting professor, was the incredible workload. Um, you know, I taught two courses a semester. Uh, I supervised the internship program, served on committees, uh, met with students, um, and it was, I mean, you know, that does not sound like a huge amount, mm -hmm. but it was. I was, um, it wasn't quite, it wasn't 24 seven, but it was more like 10 hours a week, 10 hours a day, seven days a week. Sure. Um, um, when you did submerge yourself in that culture, um, you begin, I know faculty members, you, you not only teach class, you serve on faculty committees, you right. have to involve yourself in professional service. Were there committees that you enjoyed serving on, some that you did not enjoy serving on, and if so, could you, could you talk about some of those? I served on the Undergraduate Studies Committee I think for three years, uh, and there were some satisfactions there. Uh, it's okay, by the way, if you say no committee provided me satisfaction. Was, that is a it, perfectly acceptable. You notice I said some satisfaction <laughs> there. The uh, faculty member who was the head of the committee was disorganized. I was like, just like, you know, let's try to get us back on track. Maybe we can get this process done this year instead of having to work on it again next year. Right. Um, you know, the, the history department, while I was there full-time, those five years, was generally a good place to be. Good people liked each other, respected each other. Um, so mostly that kind of administrative stuff, that committee stuff worked pretty well. Um, there were... Varying amounts of lack of respect for me because I was an educator faculty instead of a tenure line faculty, and because I wasn't doing research and publishing the way they were, mm -hmm. um, and I really had to kind of push, remind the department that I was there, that I was a competent contributing member of the department. Um, you know, an example of this is um, a 
about three years ago, um, I had taught a class where we wrote a history of a Cincinnati neighborhood. Next fall, there was a party at another faculty member's house to celebrate um, other fac of faculty members who had published books in the previous year, and mine was ignored hmm. because it was not published by an academic press. Um, you know, it, it, and I had mentioned it. I said to her, you know, hey, you know, we just, by the way, we just finished this book that I think is a really nice history of this neighborhood. Um, I'll, I'll, uh, you know, I'll bring it to the party, and when she announced who the published authors were, she didn't remember to mention me. Hmm. Um, so there was, there is a hierarchy within the academic world that um, can be sometimes hard to deal with. Well, and for me personally, as a public historian, I tend to think public historians traditionally over the, well, since they've been increasingly more a part of traditional academic history departments, kind of feel like the you know uh, uh, second-class citizen. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so, so the difference between a public historian and a academic historian is, academic you know, this academic historians publish books, full-length books that have been published by university presses, or if they're really good, if they have become a star, their books get published by commercial presses. But they're always, you know, they're, they're reviewed by other people in the field. Um, you also have to write articles that get published in professional journals. You go to conferences and give papers. Uh, public historians tend to do smaller projects, um, sometimes peer-reviewed, but not as often. Um, they're not necessarily as, I don't know, I was going to say academically rigorous, but I don't think that's quite the word there. Help me out here. Not as academically rigorous traditionally. I think, yeah. you know, it's, it's changing where public historians are being more and more, and more accepted, whereas uh, an exhibit, for instance, is being accepted now as scholarly work. Um, by some... By younger. By, <laughs> by, by some academic historians. Right. But others were like, well, that's nice. Exactly. Where the hell is your book? Right. You, you kids did a nice exhibit there. Um, where's the real scholarship? Right, where's the real scholarship? And, you know, part of it is that uh, the you know the academic historians are writing primarily for other academic mm -hmm. historians, um, um, whereas public historians are writing, putting together exhibits, web pages um, for um, uh, for the general public. So you're writing stuff that is can be understood by ordinary citizens. Um, you know, museum exhibits. The um, um, you know the, the, the text. The text is written for eighth grade or tenth grade level. It's simple. It's a hundred words, um, and um, you know Scott. You know academic scholars are writing three, four hundred page books um, that take and that quite frankly take a huge amount of work. Um, our department had just last year published a book that he'd been working on for 20 years. Um, it's won tons of awards, um, and he deserves, you know, he deserves every award he's gotten, and he put a huge amount of work into it. Um, so yeah, so increasingly, public history, the creation of history for the general public is more and more accepted within academic departments. But there are still, you know, um, still people who are like, why are we paying these people to write um, text for 10th graders? Um, 
Well, and I think there is a tradition there among public historians, too, where it, it, at times it has not been that academically rigorous. So, right. I mean, I, I do see both sides of the coin. Yeah. No, and that's true, that, that um, you know, small museums are often um, amateur or semi-amateur operations. Um, staff there are not always trained. Um, and in order to keep their doors open, they often do stuff that is incredibly ahistorical. You know, stuff that people will pay money to come see mm -hmm. that really is not well done. Um, and so, that, you know, I, I actually found myself sort of torn between, um, you know, traditional academic rigor and the complexity of the stories I wanted to tell mm -hmm. and the fact that I also wanted to make sure that, that at the very least, that an intelligent, educated public could read the stuff I was writing and understand it. Um, and I, I think I was pretty successful at that. I, um, you'll sometimes find historians, not as much as some other fields, but um, sometimes historians will write highly theoretical stuff with jargon that you're, you know, you go, what? Yeah, there's something to be said for the public intellectual that can uh, right. distill right. And concepts. You, and ultimately, I, I see the historian's job as, as being able to talk about the work they do in a way that is going to help enlighten the general public. Now, I know that you know, this book that took 20 years to write will be read by lots of scholars, and they will use that material in the classes they teach. And some of the students will go off and teach high school social studies. And so some of Chris's scholarship will get to college classes. Obviously, he's teaching it. It's in, certainly informed his teaching. And some of it will get to high schools. And some of it will get to uh, maybe to elementary school, though I, a friend of mine posted on Facebook recently a quiz that her first grader was given about Martin Luther King, and the three choices for answers, and the two of them were, abs were obviously wrong, and the third one was so simplistic. Basically, it said, what was the result of Martin Luther King's work? And the answer, the correct answer was, people are now treated fairly. It's like, wait. I don't know if this teacher made up the, that quiz or whether she it was canned or you know came from some some other place. But it showed a, a gross lack of understanding of the current state of race in this country. There's room there for there's room for yeah, significant growth. improvement. Um, well, Fritz, listen, I, I, I just want to be respectful to the class um, because we've been talking for a while now, and I've got a few more questions to ask. Not that many, but maybe some of the students here will pick up on some of those questions that I didn't ask. So I want to yeah, open it up to the that, table. That'd be great. Any anything uh, that you'd like to ask, Fritz? Alyssa. So I know you're talking a lot about your passion for social justice. So what was your involvement in activism prior to that? And I just want to repeat that for the camera. What was your involvement in activism uh, regarding your, your dedication to social justice? So that, that's, a, that's a very fair question. Um, I, it's turned out that I'm a much better academic than I am an activist. Um, um, well, it may not seem like it when I'm in the classroom. I'm really kind of shy. Um, and careful, um, and 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 having been trained as an academic, fortunately or unfortunately, makes me see things in complex ways, which makes it hard to be gung ho out in the streets, you know, tear down the walls. Um, so I'm a better I'm better at writing about this stuff and educating. Um, people about it than I am about um, organizing uh, or being, you know, being a member of an activist organization. 
though. In the late 70s, early 80s, I was part of a, um, a street theater group that did um, social justice street theater, which was kind of fun. Um, and, you know, we were, you know, we did our plays in a number of different venues. That, that, uh, so that's my one claim to fame as an activist. But I've always been, you know, and my dad was, you know, very similar, you know, in the ways that he read a lot, understood a lot of what was going on, but was not in the streets. Um, he did, however, when I was in high school, black kids who rode the school bus to our high school were accused of slashing bus seats. and. I had a good friend who was one of those African American students, and she said, "We didn't do this. You know, we're being falsely accused." And I took the story home to my dad, and um, he was outraged and got involved with a group of people who challenged uh, the school administration on it and forced um, them to apologize to the black kids. But um, yeah. Um, I think of myself more as being really good at it as a critic, social critic, and um, being able to lay out like the history of why African Americans have been displaced and discriminated against and the results of that, lay that out in a way that's accessible to um, the general public. Um, and every now and then someone will post on Facebook something related to my topic. And it's like, okay, if you want to know more about this, here's an article I wrote and here's a book that you could read and, you know, long form answers on Facebook, which, you know, only um, my closest friends read all the way through and my daughters like. <laughs> Other well, questions? I, I'm, I'm just to interject here, Alyssa, I'm reminded of, we have a, we have a case on her, Lucy Oxley, she was the first African-American graduate of the College of Medicine here in 1936. Um, in an interview done in the 80s, somebody said, you know, did you involve yourself in the civil rights movement and were you a civil rights activist? And she said, yes. And the interviewer said, well, how? She said, I, I showed up for work every day. I did my job. She had a private uh, medical practice in Avondale. Uh, primarily black neighborhood, uh, black patients, and she did that for 40 years into her 90s, uh, I think. Or, and, it's, or and it's significantly underserved, medically underserved population. Yeah, so I think, you know, she made a statement like, my activism is my life, it's my job. Um, you know, I didn't have to be on the, the news uh, throwing a Molotov cocktail. I, I, I show up for work every day and I treat the community, you know. Yeah. Any other questions? Do you think your kind of extended education, you said you got two master's, degree, master's degrees and they both took a long time with periods of work in between, do you think that your life would have turned out, say, very differently if you would have just went the, norm, I say normal, but the standard route of going get your four years for a bachelor's and two years for master's? And I don't think I was capable of doing that. Mm -hmm. I just who, who I am. Um, you know, when I went to get the master's in geology, it was, in some ways, it was kind of a whim. I'd only discovered geology as something that was interesting in the last year and a half of college. Um, you know, if it had been the last year and a half of college I'd been taking anthropology classes, I would have gone to anthropology graduate school. Um, I really, I wasn't ready when I graduated from college to commit to a career. I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, and and sort of the, you know, part of the problem or part of the, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, positive side of that was that um, what I really wanted to do was explore and try different things out. And so that when I got to the history degree, it was clear to me that that's what I wanted to do. Um, I, gave up, I kind of gave up on the masters in history because we had two infants um, and I had 
to earn, we had to earn a living. Um, but my, uh, but I knew I didn't want to be a house carpenter anymore. Um, and my advisor and another senior historian kept leaning on me. Um, and when I had the chance to come back, it was the right move. Uh, it took me four years to get my doctorate. It's going to take me 12 years to get two master's degree and four years to get a doctorate. And that was because I had, um, I'd grown up. Um, you know, I'd done a bunch of different things. Um, you know, I, I run into to people who have had professional jobs, who went, you know, graduated from college, went to law school, worked for a law firm for 20 years, and then went, F this, I am, you know, th I'm going to become, I'm going to go build furniture or I'm going to become a house carpenter. Um, I did that first. Um, and I, and while I still, I really enjoy building something with my hands, and I started this when I was in, in working on the masters, it was taking forever. I would go work, build, rebuild someone's front porch, and it was like, you know, at the end of the week, I did something. This was a mess a week ago, now there's something. So there's a, I still have a real satisfaction with working with my hands. Um, but doing history is much more important to me. Um, and and um, so that's a really kind of long and roundabout answer to your question. But I think for me, I had to grow up. I had to experiment. Um, I'm really glad. I think that if I had followed the sort of normal career path, um, I would have burned out on it in my late 30s and uh, said, screw this, I want to be a carpenter. And uh, probably would have done that for a few years and went, mm, yeah, this is okay, I'm earning some money, but no, this is not what I want to do. So um, the experimenting and growing up got me to a place that was the right place for me. And that's something that I really am worried about for my daughter's generation and you guys is that most of you are going to graduate from college with a lot of debt. And you are not going to have, it's going to be much more difficult for you to experiment. Um, you know, I was able to, uh, I had very little debt at the end of the, the geology masters, I was able to move to Cincinnati, live in a communal household, work maybe 10 months out of the year in the winter, work slow way down, I would just take two months off, um, earn a um, subsistence living, um, do political work, um, go backpacking, um, and have lots of choices. My, both my daughters are saddled with huge, but well, one of them, who, the one who went to graduate school, and her husband owe several hundred thousand dollars in college debt. They have to work. They can't just say, to hell with this, we're going to go to Europe f for six months before we have babies. And it's like, you know, we both have to have jobs, and Taking six months or a year to go to Europe or South Asia is not possible. So, if, if, sorry to build on that, but That's if somebody right. had the opportunity to say pursue what they believe they're passionate about, but may not end up finding that they're the most passionate about that, or taking more of a safe route and being able to build a foundation, maybe exploring those passions later in life, what what like advice would you give? I guess. Well. Uh, uh, again, a kind of roundabout answer to that is I learned stuff in doing the Masters in Geology that has stuck with me about certain kinds of rigor, um, about certain ways of approaching problem solving. Um, you know, I look back and it's, and it's like I've forgotten most of what I learned, most of the technical stuff I learned, but I did learn how to um, do research. 
I learned a lot about problem solving, so it wasn't a waste of time. What I would say is that you, uh, as much as possible, given the realities of a person's uh, responsibilities and uh, financial situation, you should follow your passion. Um, do what you think is what is good for you. Um, taking into account everything that that environment, you know, the environment that you're in. Um, and be willing to experiment. I think lots of people in your generation are going to change jobs multiple times, careers multiple times, um, and that's fine. It'll keep you know, it's one way to keep your life interesting. Um, I would say try not to get trapped into um, a career path that you're not sure you want to do. Fritz, I'm going to stop you there. Any other questions? All right, well then let me just bring the interview to a close, Fritz, by asking you um, two more questions. That one thing that you can encapsulate from your career here at UC of which you are most proud. If you had to pick just one thing. The research and writing I've done about um, race and housing in neighborhoods. Um, I know that people use that. Right. Every now and then someone contacts me and said, I just read, or I've been reading your stuff for years, let's talk. Or a former student will email me 10 years later and say, you know, that stuff you taught me about race changed my life. So that's really been your life's work. I mean, you've been carpenter, professor, you've done work with political organizations, but your life's work has been really about exposing uh, issues in race, housing, uh, and... Yeah, the research and writing and teaching of it, you know, um, I've done good work. Anything we haven't talked about that you feel should be on the record before we close that you'd like to say? I mean, I could go into more detail about a bunch of pieces of this. My parents' story is, I think, is a really fascinating story. Uh, don't have time to, to do that here. Um, a successive, uh, or a, a later interview. Maybe. Right. Um, no, I think this has been, been, been nicely comprehensive. Good. All right. Well, with that, we'll thank you again, and, and we'll bring this to a close. Thank you. Well, and thank you for your, your well put together questions. You're welcome. And as you said, you were very compliant. Yeah, um, right. I didn't have to do a lot of uh, lassoing. Thanks, Fritz. <laughs>